Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good, if, uh, good morning, if you are in uh, Europe. Uh, welcome to this uh, quantitative history webinar series. Uh, today, we are happy to have uh, Professor Eric Cheney uh, from Oxford University to speak on modern library holdings and historic city growth. Uh, as uh, uh, you probably know, uh, Professor Cheney uh, has been with uh, Oxford University for the last few years. Prior to that, uh, he was uh, for some years uh, with the economics department at Harvard University. So his work has, been, uh, has focused on, uh, in particular, Islamic history, uh, including uh, the Sunni revival and many other uh, changes uh, in the Islamic world. He's also an expert in particular uh, in uh, applied econometrics, uh, among other things. So today, uh, he's going to share us, share with us his most recent research. Uh, so also we have um, uh, uh, Li Duan as uh, the discussant uh, uh, following Professor Cheney's uh, talk. Uh, so in, in terms of the format uh, for today's uh, uh, webinar, we're going to follow the usual uh, uh, three. Uh, peace uh, uh, process. Uh, first, for about an hour, uh, Professor Cheney will uh, give us uh, his presentation. Then uh, Li Duan and I will give uh, some quick uh, discussions and then followed by Q&A. Uh, so if you have any questions, please post your questions in the Q&A box. I will later uh, read, uh, select and read the questions uh, for Professor Cheney. So uh, Eric, uh, welcome. So here you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much for for having me. Um, it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. So so this this project is very much ongoing, and I think it's a good time to to present it. I'm excited to get people's feedback. I am right now in between iterations here, uh, and so I'm also adding new data on the Islamic world, and so kind of some of the graphs I'm going to present today are new, not in the uh, kind of working paper that, that I've circulated kind of uh, more, more broadly. And so I just want to stress that some of the results I'm going to show you all today are preliminary. They might change, uh, but, uh, but on the other hand, you all are going to be the first to see some of these new results, particularly on the, on the Islamic world. Uh, and this project has been um, ongoing for, I mean, it builds on research I started almost 15 years ago. So this is very much the core of my research agenda. And I'm excited about the basic results. Um, hopefully I'll transmit that to you all and, and, um, and you'll also be excited about, about these data and what they'll help us, I think, to learn about, about the past. So um, the question I'm going to, to ask today very broadly is, is as follows. So estimates of historical city sizes underpin our understanding of long-run economic development. So you can look at top publications in economics over the past 15 or 20 years, and you'll see that often these historical long-run papers will be using city size. Think of Bidoff's data, which is perhaps the most used, but also Chandler, um, et cetera. And so these, these data have been used quite widely, but despite their importance, in applied research, existing estimates are low frequency. By that, I mean, usually we only have estimates of city sizes every 100 years, maybe every 50 years as we get closer to present. Um, but so they're low frequency and they're often of questionable quality. So Bayrog himself says that some of his city size estimates may be off by more than 30%. And so you know, people recognize this, but they kind of throw their hands up and say, well, this is what we have. These are the best estimates that we have. And you know, Bayrog himself, if you kind of read his, his, his book, and I think it was in the 1980s, said it's very unlikely we're going to do better than these estimates unless we go back to the original sources, say, in Europe at the local level and try to find more, more information at this kind of very micro, micro level. But I'm going to argue today that this new data set is going to allow us to improve this in ways that perhaps Bayrou could not have envisioned when he was writing, given the increases in computation power, et cetera. So that's for Europe. But for someone like me who's interested in non-Western regions, particularly the Islamic world, this day, these data issues are even more acute. 
That is to say, if I'm interested in the population of Mar, Maru in Arabic and modern day Turkmenistan, there are very, very few estimates. Chandler gives a few, or Herat in modern day Afghanistan. Um, there are very few estimates. And in fact, for some cities, there are none at all. So places like Gorgan, which historically was referred to as Astarabad, these were big cities. We don't have any estimates of how large these were, at least formal. There might be some books. Someone might say, oh, in this period, some traveler said it was this large, but there are no formal, formal estimates. And so, you know, uh, one of the reasons I'm, I'm going through what I'm going to do today is to try to provide a way to get at kind of historical city sizes, or even abstracting from that, a new proxy for, or even going beyond that, a new proxy for historical economic development where currently we don't have good metrics. So that's the question that, that I'm going to try, to try to get at today. And the basic idea is as follows. So as cities grew, all else equal, they tended to house more thinkers. Now, I'm just going to say, just take that as axiomatic. Uh, there are a lot of potential mechanisms for why that is the case. I will show you all that from a correlational standpoint, this seems to hold true. That is, you know, if you regress the change in the number of authors working, uh, change, if you regress the change in, in estimates of a city's population, say between say 1200 or 1300 over century intervals, which is for most of the intervals I'm gonna be using in this paper, on the change in the number of authors working in those cities, you get a very, very strong correlation. I'll show that, show that later. So I'm just gonna say, just make the statement as cities grew, they tended to house more, more thinkers. I'm going to remain agnostic today regarding the causality uh, of between this, this driving this relationship. So there are a lot of possibilities, right? More thinkers in a city might drive growth. There've been a lot of papers arguing kind of this link between human capital and urban development. Urban economists like Ed Glazer, other people have written about this extensively. There's also kind of on the flip side, it could be that even if you're not, you're thinking about things that don't drive growth, um, cities have larger surpluses, the larger cities are going to have larger surpluses, and so that provides rents to support these people. Um, so that's the basic idea that this paper lives and dies on, uh, this basic relationship between the fact that all else equal as cities grew, they tended to house more thinkers. Now, of course, the exact relationship between the number of thinkers and a city size is going to be specific, right? For cities like Oxford, for any given individual population, right? There's gonna be a lot more thinkers than in, in other places. And so I'm gonna you know, spend some time thinking about, about, about those issues, but kind of what this lives and dies on, which is supported by the data, is that ultimately there's a strong relationship between city size and the number of thinkers residing in that city. And so if that's the case, then you can use this correlation in two ways, right? You can use the number of authors working in a city both to the evolution of this, both as a new proxy for um, economic development. That is, when there are more workers, when there are more thinkers working in a city, that would be all else equal, right? That would be evidence that a city is becoming more developed. And conversely, when there are less, it is evidence that it's becoming less developed, um, right? In terms of economic development, um, and so. Kind of that's that's kind of the basic the basic idea uh, that, that that that's uh, that's underpinning. Okay, so let me just move forward here and talk a little bit about the data and the methods that 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 I'm that I'm going to use today. So I'm going to use the union of the largest library collections as a, an approximation to the population of all authors working in a city. I put here supplemented because I'm going to supplement this um, this data set, which I'm going to explain in detail in a few minutes with historical data on authors from the Islamic world, given evidence that these, this union of um, libraries, while it almost provides, or provides a, a pretty good approximation to the population of authors working in Europe, provides a less perfect approximation to those working in the Islamic world. So I'm gonna try to remedy that using historical sources from the Islamic world, which is what I've spent the last 15 years trying to, trying to collect. Uh, and is, to my knowledge, the largest collection of these thinkers that, that, that's been digitized and that exists. So today I'm going to focus on Europe and the Islamic world. This is mainly because of my linguistic um, 
uh, limitations. Like I was saying earlier before the seminar started, um, you know, I don't read any East Asian languages. And uh, even though I have a lot of East Asian authors in my, in my data set, but you know, I think that this is an, a clear extension for what I'm doing today is to see the extent to which this holds in places like modern day India, China, um, et cetera. So that's the data set that I'm gonna use. I'm gonna talk about it in, in a lot more detail in a few minutes. What I'm going to find is that the number of authors working in a city, the changes in the number of authors working in a city is strongly correlated with changes in existing estimates of city size. And so I'm going to then develop a framework which uh, is very tightly related to the work on luminosity, right? The AER paper from over about a decade ago um, uh, to then gain high, to, to improve upon existing city size estimate that's related to luminosity work. Uh, but something that's kind of new is I'm going to develop a framework here to gain high frequency insights into the evolution of a group of cities, which in a lot of situations, people are interested in difference and difference coefficients between groups of cities, one of which is treated with some treatment, the other is not treated. And so in that framework, I'm going to develop a, a, um, a, a new kind of uh, way of using the data or using these data to get at these difference and difference coefficients at a very high level of frequency. So to kind of fix ideas, let me start with a motivating example, which is Cordoba in modern day Spain. I chose Cordoba because it's kind of bridges these two, these two worlds, right? So before 1236 CE, it was part of the Islamic world, at least after 800, which is where I'm gonna start for today. And after 1236, it was part of the Latin Christian West. And so it kind of spans both of these, these, these these geographic regions. And it also was for a while considered to be the largest city in, uh, in Europe. So this is what we have right now. This is Bidoff's data. Uh, I believe Von Zanden and co-authors uh, revised the, these data down a little bit, which uh, I think is probably right given the evidence I'm gonna show you in a few minutes. But this is what uh, Cordoba, these are the estimates that we have. So on the y-axis, we have the population in thousand. And on the x-axis, we have the date um, the, where this, where the, uh, where Bido is, is measuring the city size. So you see in 800, you know, you have an estimate in 900, there's no estimate in 1100, there's no estimate. Uh, and then you have estimates roughly every, every hundred years out. So, so, so the end of the sample, and I'm going to stop today, uh, in 1799. Now, these two red lines are as follows. The first red line is the death of, uh, Almansur, known in Spanish as Almanzor. Uh, which signified the, the kind of end of the Umayyad Caliphate in uh, Al-Andalus and the beginning of civil war in Al-Andalus and the decline of Cordoba as the capital of the Umayyad Caliphate, known as the Fitna in Arabic. And the second line is 1236, which is the Christian uh, conquest of the city in 1236. Okay, so now I'm going to show you two graphs. I'm going to show you the number of authors that are dying in Cordoba. And then I'm gonna show you the smooth value of that quantity. So here are the number of authors, and I'll talk about where these come from in a few minutes, that are dying in Cordoba from both Islamic sources and this union of, of, of total, uh, of all the catalog. And on the y-axis, I have the number of authors dying by year. And on the x-axis, I have the date in which they died. And then the two, the two vertical lines are the same as before. And here, you know, this is very stark. You can see here that when you get the beginning of the fitna, there is almost a vertical kind of line here. You can see it in the raw data, which is always which is always good. But if you smooth this to get kind of a little bit more clear vision, you get something that looks like this. And if you look at this and compare it with this, oops, uh, you compare this with this, you seem to roughly line up. And that's ultimately kind of the, I think one of the key insights of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, the fact that, that the number of authors working in a city is going to be a pretty good proxy for city size. So for the rest of the talk over the next uh, 45 minutes or so, I'm going to proceed as follows. First, I'm going to start with the conceptual framework because I think it's really important here to fix ideas. There's a lot of ways you might think to use this data. So I'm going to show you all the way that I'm thinking about these, these questions. Then I'm going to talk about the data. Uh, then perhaps most the most exciting part of this is going to be the empirical analysis where I kind of use the data to shed additional insights 
uh, onto some historical questions. Particularly, I'm excited about the results on the Mongol invasions to the Eastern Islamic world, where we currently have no estimates at all, uh, at least systematic. And then I'm going to conclude. So that's kind of where, where, we're, where, we're, where we're going over the, next, over the next 45 minutes or so. So let's just jump right in. So we start with the conceptual framework. Excuse me. So let's start. I'm going to start by denoting authors working in city J at time T by the quantity capital C J T. And I'm going to assume that authors die with constant probability, which I'm going to denote by pi, and are observable today with probability PT, which I'm going to allow to vary by time. And that could be because, you know, um, authors' uh, works are lost. Um, you know, that's kind of the way I'm thinking about it here. But I'm assuming here that authors are going to die with, with a constant probability. And, um, you know, but I'm going to allow the observational uh, probability to vary by time. That is, you know, as we get closer to the present, uh, we can observe authors with a greater, with a greater probability. Well, if that's the case, then the observable number of authors today are going to be distributed as follows. I'm going to call the observable number of authors X, J, T, where J again denotes cities and T time. It's going to be distributed as a binomial random variable with the parameters C, J, T, and uh, you know, probability, which I'm going to call gamma T, which is going to vary by time. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward. Now, um, let's define an indicator variable, D, J, just again to group uh, cities into two groups, like often you can think of the Atlantic trade, places that were affected by the Atlantic trade, places that weren't, places that were affected by the Mongol invasions, places that weren't. So that's just going to be kind of a holder for uh, a group of cities. And I'm going to sum here the number of authors I observe in a uh, city across those groups of cities. That is, I will sum up all the authors who are working in the Atlantic traders, and then I will also sum up all the authors that are not working in the land of players. So that's just a very simple example of two, of two groups. So, okay, you can do that. Um, but as the number of authors underlying the, the observed authors grows, grows large, that is, you know, I sum across a bunch of cities, say, you know, you have big cities like Baghdad, Damascus, Cairo, et cetera. As you sum across these cities, uh, the underlying number of authors are going to become very large. And so then you can use a binomial, you can use the normal approximation of the binomial distribution, and you will get that the total number of authors is going to be distributed approximately normally with uh, you know, this mean and this variance. So this is very straightforward. You kind of learned this in, in, in an undergraduate probability course. Um, and so uh, that hopefully makes sense. So then you can take that if this is distributed normally, and then you can calculate what I'm going to call a difference in difference estimate. That is, I can take the logarithm of the authors working in a group of city J, again, Atlantic traders in places that were uh, subject to Mongol invasions, and I can take the logarithm of the total number of authors working in those groups of cities in a given time period, subtract from that the total number of authors working in that same group of cities in a different time period. Here, I'm just assuming in a previous time period. And then I can subtract from it the change in the total number of authors working in a group of cities, the group of cities outside of that group, say the non-Atlantic traders, the places that were not subject to Mongol invasion. And then kind of it just follows straightforwardly that the distribution of this difference in difference estimator will be centered around what I mean, right, uh, as follows. This, this quantity right here, or just in words, the differential growth uh, of the average number of authors working in a group of Cs between T minus one and T. So this is kind of, you can use the number of authors, right? Sum them across cities, take the differences, and then you know, compare that with the difference in another group of cities. And then that will give you an estimate of the differential growth in the number of authors working in cities, uh, right? Between T minus one and T. So for example, the Atlantic traders, if you find that there's a positive um, uh, difference in, in a given time period, right, two time periods, that would be evidence that the Atlantic traders uh, are housing more thinkers over that time period than the comparison group. 
And that's interesting. But if we're willing to go a little bit further and make the assumption that the relationship between the number of authors working in a city and its population is stable over time, that is, if we assume that the number of authors working in a city is related to its underlying population by some stable parameter that varies by city, then you can do the following. Um, and I don't want to belabor this too much in, in, in the interest of time. But you can write this, right, the, uh, the previous quantity, which is the differential growth of the average number of authors working in, in the city is actually equal to this weighted average, right, of the growth rates of those cities, where the population weights uh, are going to be as follows. They are going to be uh, giving higher weight to cities that are more knowledge intensive. That is, if you have a larger population, you're going to get more weights, all else equal. And if you have a greater knowledge intensity, you're also going to get more weight. And so that's what I think a lot of these assumptions are probably decent approximations to reality. I'll give you some uh, empirical examples of that in, in a few minutes. Um, but it gives us a way, I think, to think about what we're able to identify. That is, if you look at the changes in number of authors dying you know, within a group of cities over time, and it's kind of difference in difference framework is what I'm calling it. What you're going to get is you are going to get plausibly an estimate of the weighted average of the, the differential growth in these cities where the weights are going to give higher, um, higher weight to cities that are more knowledge intensive. So hopefully that makes intuitive sense. Uh, and it's kind of what's going to underpin a lot of what I'm, what I'm going to do uh, for, for the remainder of today's, of today's talk. Um, okay, that's the first part of the contextual framework. So then you might say, okay, maybe that makes sense. Hopefully it makes sense. But can we say anything about the population, uh, populations themselves? So we actually can. And you, we can use these data to improve upon existing estimates. Now, of course, without strong assumptions, right, which I'm not willing to make here, uh, I'm not going to be able to back out these individual growth rates, right? You need to know this, you need to know these weights, you need to know all this stuff. And uh, I have no way of, of knowing those things. But there clearly is some information in these data about um, city evolution. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the correlation between uh, existing city size estimates and the data that I'm going to, to use to improve upon the existing estimates of city growth. And I've tried to explain this different ways as I presented it over the past, the past uh, bit. And um, I think maybe the most intuitive way to do this is, is what I'm gonna try to do today, which is talking about Stein's paradox. Because uh, ultimately that's what this phenomenon is rooted in. And so just a brief over, overview of, of Stein, Stein's paradox. If you assume here, don't be put off by the, by the notation. If, if you assume that uh, existing estimates of city growth are measured in what I guess economists or econometricians would call strong measurement error. Uh, and here this assumption of normality was made by Stein. Um, you can relax it under large sample sizes but I'm just going to make it by him, make, make the assumption of normality, the errors right now, just for, just for convenience. But ultimately, um, this phenomenon in one way or another is gonna be robust to violations of normality, as long as this, these kind of strong uh, classical measurement error assumptions hold. Um, but in any case, if you assume that there's, this, that there's kind of classical measurement error in the, in the Stein sense, um, then you get the following result. If, the number of cities, um, which is K here, is greater than four, um, then in essence here, I don't want to, we don't have a huge amount of time, so I don't want to belabor this, but in essence, you can do better than using the individual city estimates um, in a mean squared error sense. And what do I mean by that? I'll come back to this in a second. If, 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 I, if, if, I, if it's not clear, but maybe the best way to, to, to do, to build intuition here, is just to give an example. So, so this result, which is known as Stein's paradox, initially shocked the statistical world. So why? Suppose that a researcher seeks to estimate London's growth rate between 1600 and 1700, and that Stein's assumptions hold. Well, Stein's paradox implies that lumping together the estimation of London's growth rate 
together with that of Baghdad between 1200 and 1300, Venice between 1400 and 1500, and Freiburg over the same period, and then shrinking each individual estimate towards the average growth rate of the four cities will lead to more precise estimates in a mean squared error sense than using the original London, Baghdad, Venice, and Freiburg estimates separately. And so this comes from a classical kind of overview article where the author was using here baseball uh, averages for those of you that are familiar with the United States and baseball. But, but what this is, it shows here that the shrinkage estimator in, in action that ultimately here, what happens, these are the observed uh, quantities. You can think of these just as being growth rates. And this is the overall average of all of the individuals here that are being considered. And so what Stein's estimator does is it shrinks the individual estimates towards the overall mean. Okay, so this, this in, illustrates the seeming paradox, seemingly paradoxical nature of Stein's result. It does not require the constituent estimation problems to have a sensible relationship to each other, uh, as long as his assumptions hold. Now, this was a shock. And you know, if you kind of look at the secondary literature today, I think people still kind of struggle to, to gain intuition for why this, why this holds. Now, for today, I'm just going to assume that it does hold because it does hold, and you kind of consider it maybe like the central limit theorem. It's just something that, that, that is. And so the, this, this result is, 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 is interesting, but it can be used in, in, this, in this example, what I'm talking about today is followed. So people noticed this and they were shocked by this result. Um, the fact that this, these, these kind of shrinkage estimators will always outperform the individual estimates in a mean squared error sense, but the gains are only gonna be sizable, right? When the underlying problems are relatively close to each other, which I think makes more intuitive sense. And this here is where covariates, such as the observed changes in author counts can help. If Stein's kind of method holds conditional on the observed um, author growth, then the observed true growth rates will lie closer to each other than in the unconditional case. That is, you know, if you just give me all of Bidoff's growth rates, I can do better than what Bidoff did by shrinking them towards the overall mean of, of all the growth rates, as long as Stein's rule holds, the assumptions under Stein's um, method hold. But if I have a covariate here, right, the total number of authors, I can do this, and in, 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 in Stein's um, result holds conditional on this, I can shrink conditional on, on, the, on the growth rates, and that will do better uh, than the unconditional shrinkage. And in fact, you, know, you can improve upon the existing estimates, perhaps by a considerable amount, to the extent that um, author growth predicts city growth strongly. So you know, given time constraints, I'm going to refrain from additional technicalities, like a little bit about normality. This has a Bayesian interpretation, which is really nice, which we talk about in the, uh, in the paper. Uh, but what I wanted to do today is just to make intuitively clear how it is that author count can be used to improve upon existing data. And one more caveat that I want to just stress is that this is a mean squared error improvement. That is, there is no guarantee that any of my individual estimates after kind of using Stein's method conditional on, the, on, on author growth are gonna be more exact than say von Zanden's estimate or Bidoff's estimate. All I can say is that their mean squared error will be lower. You know, whether any individual estimate is better or worse is something that, that, that this method can't say. All it can say is that mean squared error, they're, they're gonna be lower. And so you're going to get efficiency gain, which I'll show you towards the end of the talk today. But that's the conceptual framework. So I'm gonna use these, these data in two ways. First, I'm gonna use them as a high frequency measure or city growth where, again, here I'm gonna get some kind of weighted average uh, of, the, of the underlying growth rates under the assumptions that I, that I talked about earlier. And then I'm gonna use these data to improve upon existing population. Those are two related exercises, but they are, they are separate. Okay. So um, you know, feel free if there, if there are questions, clarification questions, et cetera, I'm happy to, to answer. Um, but um, I'm just going to push on now, and I'll talk a little bit about the, about the data. So the data, the main set of data is going to come from the Vioc data set. So if you want to Google this, you can see what this is. It's available online. This is the virtual international authority file. 
And what this is going to, to do is it's going to provide a population or approximation of the population of the world's authority file. So what, what is an authority file? Let me illustrate this by using the uh, Iranian astronomer, Shamsuddin Khafri, who I believe worked in the 16th century. This individual has a biop number uh, 12056-4917. And so and you can Google this and you can see uh, you know, this, this, this author. So, so what, what, are these, what are these data? Ultimately, um, you can think of authority files as follows. So in any individual library, the Library of Congress, La Biblioteca Nacional de España, uh, the National Library of Morocco, um, right, when they have um, works by a given author, they will create um, an, electronic, um, uh, an electronic record for that author which will have that author's name, in this case, Shamsuddin Khafri, and then all of the variants of the name underneath that, that kind of heading. And so those are called authority files. And as you might suspect, different libraries are going to choose different authoritative names. Sometimes uh, you know, they'll include one part of the name if it's an Islamic name and not the other. Sometimes they'll include the date within the name, sometimes they won't. And so across the libraries of the world, different libraries are gonna have different authority files, which are going to, in essence, index their entire collections. If they have a work uh, by an author in manuscript or in print, it will go under these, these headings. Now, what Viaf initially set out to do was to provide a uniform um, kind of overview of these, these authority files. That is provide an authority file of, a, of an authority file so that all the variants of Shamsuddin al-Khafri across the national libraries have you know, one kind of uniform heading. And that is the, the data that I am going to use. So this draws on some of the largest library collections in the, in the, in the entire world. And it was initially a project between the Library of Congress in the United States, the Deutsche National Bibliothek in, in, in Germany, La Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and the Online Computer Library Center. And it has since been joined by the, most of the world's largest libraries. And as of August, 2017, it contained the following libraries. Uh, let's leave this up for a second so people can, can, can look at them. Uh, I've highlighted a few that have a lot of collections on the, on the, on the Islamic world, uh, but you know, I will in a few minutes kind of talk about the coverage here, which people might, might be thinking about. My claim is that to a first approximation, this provides um, the population of all known works or works that have survived till today that are held in libraries across the world. Um, so selection issues, I guess I'll just dive into this right away. Um, this is what I just said here for Europe. I claim the data represent an approximation of the population of all authors who works have survived. So you might want me to demonstrate this, and I certainly would if I were observing this presentation. And so what I do is I um, use the following. I use the USTC, which is, I guess, the Universal Short Title Catalog, which brings together information on all books published in Europe between the invention of printing in 1650. I scrape this entire uh, kind of uh, catalog of, of titles, and then I took a random sample of 1,000 editions. Of these thousand editions, 643 had both a print year and a primary author. And of these, I was able to find 93%, with a confidence interval of 91 and 95% of the authors in VIA. This falls to 81% when I just limit to the VIA authors with dates. But here, I think you wanna look at, at this first number here because uh, for a lot of these, these books, you know, we don't actually know the exact date when their authors work. And so this is just to say that the VIAF data set provides a reasonable approximation to the population of uh, authors working in, in Europe, at least during this period. So I'm never gonna be able to test this globally, but locally, it seems at least in Europe over this time period that the data do, do a pretty good job of, of providing the population of authors that are working during this time period. So that's uh, for kind of the entire world uh, and the coverage from Europe is, is phenomenal. Now, what about for the Islamic world? I'm gonna supplement these data with the, what are known in Arabic as the tabaqat. 
So I don't know how, how much people are familiar with this, but historically in the Islamic world, each city would come together and create a who's who of important authors. Uh, and so those are known as the, the, the tabakat, and they will they provide, for example, you know, famous people working in Baghdad in a given time period, um, you know, in other cities, Aleppo, uh, Fez, et cetera. Uh, so this is, to my knowledge, the largest um, compendium of these of these tabakat that has been assembled and digitized. We can talk about the individual tabakat that I used. They contain the most famous ones, if anyone knows about these. Uh, Ibn Khalikan's uh, Wafayat al Ayan is probably the most, one of the most famous, but there are other famous ones as well. Uh, this has been called by historians of the Islamic world the greatest untapped source of information because there are literally uh, tens of thousands of, uh, of these biographies. And up until now, you know, this was kind of, historians have recognized this for a long time, but people have struggled to utilize these, operationalize the source. And the methodology I just talked about a few minutes ago suggests one way that you can do this. That's what I'm going to do today. So how, what's the coverage look like here? Um, and this is very preliminary. So you can use uh, Fuat Sezgin's uh, GAS, which is, provides, I think, the most comprehensive overview of thinkers working in the Islamic world before 1100, and per, do a kind of a similar thing as I did for the, for the Universal Short Title Catalog. I am doing that random sample right now. Uh, matching takes longer, but um, the coverage in essence is going to increase. I'm pretty sure of that uh, from about say 30% to maybe 70%. These are super preliminary results. They might, they might change, but this is going to help. Uh, this source is gonna help a lot to get coverage of the Islamic world to something roughly comparable to that of Europe, although uh, not, 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 not perfect. Uh, but it will, in essence, increase my sample size by, by, by a considerable amount. Of course, you might worry about selection issues, et cetera. We can talk about those more in the q and A. I've thought about them a lot. And you can, you can deal with a lot of them within the framework that, that, I, that I developed a few minutes ago. But those are, those are the data. Um, so to just kind of provide a, a, a graph here of what this looks like, for Europe, you can graph the total number of authors over time, and this is kind of a nice check of the conceptual framework, right? So recall that we assumed initially the sum of authors should be well approximated by a normal, normal distribution, right? With the uh, observation probability times the total number of uh, authors, right? Underlying authors is the mean. But if that's the case, then by the delta method, right? You take the log of this, you get the following. Now, what I want people to focus on here is the variance, right? As the number of underlying authors increases, this goes to infinity, what happens to the variance? Well, it goes to zero. So the variance in log author count should decrease as the underlying number of authors increases. And that's what you see here. here. So on the y-axis here, you have the log number of authors. On the x-axis, you have the death year. Here are the number of authors dying in each year um, within Europe. And you can see as, as time goes on, it's more tightly concentrated around this line, which is consistent with the conceptual framework I developed a few minutes ago. If you want to say, what are all these dots right here? These are approximate dates, right? So if you say flourish 17th century, you are going to be assigned the year 1600. For today, I'm not correcting for this. You, know, you can distribute these guys uniformly over the century if you want to. The results don't change a huge amount. I've left things uh, like this just for transparency's sake. Um, but you, know, I, I, you can clearly um, correct for this, for this bunching if, if people are uncomfortable with this. And the results are not, uh, don't, are not, are not sensitive to that. Uh, but that's just to explain why you get some of the bunching. Some of the bunching you'll see in um, some of the graphs I'm going to show over the next, the next few minutes. So how do I georeference these authors? I'm going to use three primary sources, and I'm mostly going to use automated methods although I use a combination of automated and manual methods um, at time. I'm gonna use the library collections themselves. Sometimes say in a library, they'll have information about where an author was born or an author worked, et cetera. I'm gonna use Wikipedia, which uh, is kind of one of the, the more difficult ones to do because you have to look for city names within a, within a group of text. And then I'm gonna use the author itself and the author names. So sometimes you can think of Silvertus Toletanos, who suggests this author worked in Toledo in modern day Spain. 
and names, which is one of the few cities I have that's in modern day China, Kajgar, right? Uh, you can think of the name in Arabic, the Nizba Kajgari suggests that this author was affiliated with or worked in Kajgar in what is today China. So um, the total number of, of authors that I have who died before 1500 and after 800 and have a date is over 500,000. Using these methods, I'm able to geo-reference over 300,000 of these of these authors. And this is what the geo-reference data look like. Here I'm zooming in on Europe, uh, just because if I were to zoom out a little bit more and give you the entire Islamic world, Europe would just look like a big blob. So here this gives you a little sense of the of the of the distribution. And across space, this is summing all authors in my data set. And these big circles are really big, like thousands and thousands of authors uh, dying in these cities. So, um, you know, this hopefully makes kind of intuitive sense. There's a lot of concentration here in places that we know were very economically developed. You can see kind of the fertile crescent, et cetera. Okay. Um, so let me continue here. Uh, talking a little bit about, and just dive into the, to the empirical analysis. I think I have about 20 minutes left. Uh, so I'll try to um, make, time I have, make sure I have time to, to talk about some of these, but I think is the most exciting part of this project. Uh, here, I'm just going to skip this, given I don't have a huge amount of time here, uh, just to show that there's a very, very strong correlation between the existing growth uh, in city sizes here. Right, so this is the uh, change in Vidoff's data, and this is a uh, uh, change in the number of authors. You can see here there's, there's two stats that are very, very large, which hopefully makes sense. There's a very strong correlation between uh, existing city size growth and the growth in the number of authors. This is what this looks like in a graph. On the x-axis here, I have the change in the, in the number of authors working between 1,300 and 1,700. And here is the change in the estimates of city sizes. And this is, you know, this looks good. Uh, a pretty strong relationship. So then you might say, okay, that's for Europe. What about the Islamic world? Now, what I'm gonna show you today is not incorporating, uh, this following graph it does not incorporate um, the new data from the Tabakot, but this is what the relationship looks like for the Islamic world, just using the VIOC data. This line right here is uh, what the European relationship looks like between, again, on the y-axis population growth, on the x-axis author growth. And this is what it looks like for the Islamic world. Uh, you can't distinguish between the null hypothesis that these two slopes are, are equal to each other. The purpose of this graph is just to say, look, this relationship also seems to hold for the Islamic world in addition to the European world. So this is not just a, uh, something that's happening in Europe. That is more cities as cities get larger, they seem to house more, more thinkers. So the conceptual framework suggests that, um, you know, I can use these data to estimate difference in differences at high frequency. And today I'm going to do this using uh, two major historical events to, I think, hopefully uh, demonstrate the value of these data set and what we can learn from it. So first I'm going to start by revisiting the rise of the Atlantic traders. And then I'm gonna talk about the Mongol invasions. We know a decent amount about this. We know very little from an empirical standpoint about this event. And so uh, I'm gonna kind of use this one to show you, yeah, this seems to make sense. And then I'm going to use this to hopefully learn something new about the long run effects of the Mongol invasions on the Eastern Islamic world. So let's just start by talking about the, um, the long run effects of the Atlantic trade. So Asamago Johnson and Robinson brought this to the attention of economists in an article, I guess 20 years ago. And they were very upfront about the fact that their analysis was limited by Bidoff's data. They were missing data for many Atlantic traders, um, places such as Nantes in France or Cadiz in, in modern day Spain. There was a lot of, kind of gaps in their data for those cities. And so that kind of limited their analysis. They had to drop these cities and they also could only examine the effect they were interested in by hundred year intervals. And so what I'm gonna do is uh, in the next few minutes for each of these examples is the following. I'm going to provide you all kind of visual time series of the number of authors working in a few prominent cities and then a control group. 
And then I'm gonna give you the difference in difference estimates um, in a graph, which will hopefully make this more palatable and also hopefully convince you of the value of what I'm, what I'm doing here. So first I'll show you what happens in London. Here's the total number of authors dying in London. On the y-axis, I have the number of authors dying. On the x-axis, I have the year of death from 800 to 1800. Here again, is, this is 1492. And you see that there is an uptick, but later, right, I don't know, about 15 something when this starts, if you run a trend break on this. Um, but this is what these, these looks like for London. I'll just go through now. This is what this looks like for Amsterdam. This is the golden age and then kind of the, the, the decline. This is what this looks like for Sevilla or Seville in Spain. You might say, oh, what's going on here? There seems to be more intellectual activity. Well, it was part of the Islamic world during this period, right? But here after the, the Atlantic discoveries, you see at least it looks like there's kind of a, a growth, growth here. And you can compare it to a city like Paris, which wasn't directly involved in the Atlantic trade, where you don't seem to get such a big, a big jump. And here, again, I present this just in raw numbers as opposed to logarithms, just because the, the trends are so stark. Um, you know, just wanted to save people from having to think in logarithms if people don't like to do that. So you can do this, and then, as I talk about in the paper, how you would operationalize this for the difference in difference framework. This is what you get. Here's the effects of the Atlantic trade um, on the Atlantic traders by year. Again, these are going to be the different diff coefficients. Here is the date, and this is the smooth difference in difference coefficients. So you can track by year, right, the differential growth of the Atlantic traders. And you can see that this starts really in earnest, probably in the second half of the 16th century, and then kind of uh, tapers off at the beginning of the 18th century. Um, and so here again, these are just point estimates, but it provides uh, point estimates where we currently don't have them uh, by year. And again, this is gonna be more heavily weighted to, knowledge, to large knowledge intensive Atlantic traders, but it allows us to, to, to kind of do this, provide these difference in difference coefficients by year. So now I wanna to go to the second example, the, the Mongol invasion. So this has often been invoked as a critical juncture in the economic history of the Islamic world. But yet to my knowledge, there are no systematic empirical analyses of its effect. Indeed, if you, were try, if you were to try to do an AJR type um, uh, analysis with kind of the existing data, you wouldn't get very far because for the Eastern Islamic world, the areas that were hit directly by the Mongol invasions, we don't have um, kind of a nice time series of city estimates for most of the cities. And so this is just a quote that I found in, a, in an overview article. Uh, on the Mongol invasions, just to kind of motivate this, what some historians say, some people have talked about the Mongol invasions as being a catastrophe, which changed the face of the world forever. Um, and particularly here, the, the Islamic world. For such a big event, we don't have very many kind of systematic empirical uh, ev evidence or investigation of, of, of this event. And so again, I'm going to do the same thing I did before. I'm going to begin by motivating the example um, by motivating this by using four cities, three which were directly invaded by the Mongols um, and destroyed in many cases by them. So I'm going to show you the time series of Baghdad, which had 200,000 people in 1200. Uh, I think this is Vanzan's estimate, Herat, which had 44,000 in 1200. Uh, I think this is Chandler's estimate, if I recall correctly, Mer or Maru, which had 100,000 in 1100. That's the closest estimate that we have. And then as the control, I'm gonna use Cairo, which had 200,000 and 1,200. And this is what this looks like. So again, this is the same format as what I talked about a few minutes ago here. We have Baghdad, uh, the total number of authors on the y-axis that are dying in a given year. On the x-axis, again, you have the, the date which they died. 1258 is when Baghdad was sacked by the Mongols. And that looked pretty stark. You can do the same thing for Herat in modern day Afghanistan. And this is the date when it was sacked. It was earlier than Baghdad. I don't know the exact date off the top of my head. I looked it up a few days ago when I made this graph, but you can see here that there's also this stark kind of disappearance of authors working in Herat that we can observe today after it's sacked by the Mongols. 
And then finally, you can look at uh, Maru Mur in modern day Turkmenistan, and you see something that looks somewhat similar to what happened in Herat. And then you can look in Cairo, and here I just, Cairo was not sacked by the Mongols. And this right here is uh, the date which uh, Baghdad was sacked, 1258. And you see there doesn't seem to be any huge change around this date. And then this second graph here, the second line here is when the Ottomans uh, took over Cairo. Whether or not this is actually a real decline in Cairo's uh, population or a change in the underlying relationship between knowledge production and city side is something that I think is open to interpretation, but I just wanted to flag that in case people were, were curious about why you did this decline after that. Okay, so you can do the same thing and calculate the difference in difference coefficients across all the cities. And here I want to be very specific. I am throwing out Islamic cities in Spain because of you know, the back and forth between Christians and Muslims, and also Turkey. Um, and I'm using both Chandler's data, uh, Chandler's cities and Van Zanden's city. Uh, and the, the, the treated group here are going to be places that were invaded by the Mongols directly, and the control group are places that aren't. And this right here is uh, the start of the Mongol invasions when they first invaded Iran. And this right here is these next two dates are just, this is when the collapse of the Al-Khanid um, um, empire. Um, kind of for, uh, for reference, this is the rise of the Safavids uh, in, in what is today Iran. And so what you see here, again, this, these are just point estimates, I don't have standard errors, and I don't wanna go too far because this is preliminary. What I am almost 100% sure of is this is not gonna go away. But interestingly enough, at least from this exercise as I've run it for today, it seems like the effects of the Mongol invasion lasted for a really long time, at least 300 years. Now, whether or not, you can distinguish this from zero at the end. I don't know, I have not run those tests yet, but this is certainly consistent with the hypothesis that the Mongol invasions had a very large impact on the Eastern Islamic world that was uh, kind of long lasting. And you can kind of already get that from the three examples I showed you a few minutes ago. Okay, so of course you could do this for a lot of other events as well. I'm here not trying to obviously exhaust all this, I'm just trying to give you all uh, a few examples of what you can do with these data that you currently can't do with what we have. So finally, I have only a few more minutes left. I have about uh, nine or 10 minutes. So how can you kind of use these data to improve upon existing estimates? Um, so what I just showed you was the first part of the, of, the, um, of the exercise, right? I can get these difference in difference coefficients by year. How can you use these data to improve upon existing estimates? Well, as I mentioned earlier, it's impossible to recover individual growth rates without strong assumptions. But as I also said before, obviously the data contain information on underlying city growth. And so what you can do is you can shrink the existing estimates to exploit this information. So again, because of, because of, um, of time constraints, I'm going to you know, skip the technical details. But I'm going to illustrate how this works using Nantes in modern day France, where you know, we don't have estimates for a lot of years. So here, this is the year. These are in the second column here, we have existing estimates of city sizes. So this is in thousands, so 40,000 and 1,700, 25,000 and 1,600, 14,000 and 1,500, 1,300, I mean, in 1,300 or 8,000 people. These, the Z here is going to be existing estimates of city size. And this right here is the author level plus one. This right here is author growth. What I want you all to focus on here is these are gonna be the fitted values that I'm going to shrink these, um, these, uh, these existing estimates towards. And this is just to, to show you how this, how this shrinkage works. So you're gonna pull the existing estimates towards this line and get new um, estimates of city growth. And then you can iterate this backwards, right? And here I'm gonna do that by assuming that the estimate in 1700 is, is correct. Um, because ultimately, you know, this, this um, uh, framework, the way I've set it up, is not going to pin down what the exact levels of city growth, of, of city size are, it only is going to pin down growth rates. But, um, you know, I talk about that more in detail in the paper, but here to just illustrate how this works, 
I've made this assumption and done it in level. And so what you can see here is that, you know, this provides estimates of city sizes where none currently exist. So how much has this changed things? Well, I'm gonna illustrate this by, uh, again, revisiting the Atlantic traders. I did this before by using the difference and difference kind of framework where it actually provides this kind of weighted average. Uh, but you can also use these data to improve upon existing estimates and rerun the AJR estimate with the new data. So AJR work in levels, so I'm gonna do that as well. Although, like I said, you can easily transform this to, to differences, which is something I do, I do in the paper. So this is what, the, uh, what, this, what this looks like. So in the first column here, which I call old, I provide the AJR um, kind of one of their, their main uh, results, uh, column of results. And what you see here is, you know, this is the, the Western dummies p-value, which they present in their, in, their, in their paper. So I present it here as well. And, but the main coefficient of interest for what I'm gonna talk about right now are these interaction terms. And this is, their, this is just their original results. And you can kind of look here. This is what we're gonna compare the, uh, the results using the new data to. Here, this is just the raw number of authors. Again, these are, I'm gonna sum these around a, around a window. And so don't read too much into this positive coefficient here because this is going to include authors who died up until 1549 because I, I sum around a, a hundred year window. But this is, what this, this is what this looks like. Here in the third column, I present their uh, results, right? Their specification but using the new data and kind of um, you know, shrinking this data using uh, Stein's method. And what you see here is that you know, the standard errors go down. And as you would, you would expect, um, given the efficiency gains. And what I do in the final column is I now use the data both right that they use, but then I also use the cities that they couldn't use because of missing data. And what you see here is that their results uh, continue to hold, but if you look at these, these efficiency gains, they're, they're pretty large, right? The standard errors drop from 0.2 to 0.14. The point estimates remain, you know, roughly, roughly similar. And so, you know, this, in this example, right, you might say, well, okay, this, this helps, but what does this really kind of, do we learn much from this? Um, I think you do in terms of, you know, the, the, the frequency issues, right? You can do things that they couldn't do. But in a lot of situations, right, these efficiency gains could be, could be huge. Some effects that currently aren't statistically significant might be um, because, right, you just have, you have, you have more efficiency. So I think that using the, this, this modified data set uh, will help to, uh, researchers to be able to, to um, you know, identify the, the coefficients they're interested in much more precisely. Okay, so I am pretty much out of time here. I have uh, three minutes, so I'll just conclude. I've provided a new source of information on the historical evolution of city size, and you know, perhaps even more so the historical evolution of economic activity, um, which I think is driving both of these things, city sizes and author counts. Under plausible assumptions, uh, a differential increase in authors is sufficient to conclude that there was a differential increase in city sizes between groups of cities. What these new data allow for are for high frequency analysis where none is currently possible. And as I've showed you kind of the second part of the conceptual framework, it can also be used to improve upon existing growth estimates. And so where do, where do I go from here? Well, you know, I'm gonna use these data for my own you know, purposes, especially in the Islamic world. There's a lot of things you could, you could use these for in terms of economic outcomes. I'm also going to use this to measure scientific production as ultimately these individuals are you know, writing on certain topics. But I think that hopefully researchers will find these data useful and use them to investigate a bunch of uh, things in the economic history literature that we currently have a hard time identifying. So you know, in the Islamic world, you can think of what was the effects of the Barbary pirates on city growth in North Africa. That's something you could plausibly investigate with these data. And there's no reason why, and this is what I'll end with here, there's no reason why you have to, to just limit yourself between 800 and 1800. There's a lot of information, uh, not only on non-Western kind of regions, but also going back in time. 
So here's Rome. Here's the total number of authors uh, dying in Rome from minus 500 till 1799. And the red line is you know, 1476, which is the fall of the Western Roman Empire. And so here you can see that there are a lot of authors in my data set here that are working during the golden age of Rome. And you could do something similar for Athens as well. This is just to say that I don't think that this methodology is limited either to the Islamic world or to Europe, um, kind of after 800, it could be used in a wide scenario, a wide range of, of scenarios, and hopefully will help us better understand the, the past. So that's all I have for, for you all today. Thank you for, for coming um, and, for, and for listening to me, inviting me. Um, I hope you all have, have learned something and enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, so um, before I turn it over to uh, Li Duan, yeah, I, I have uh, one quick question. Uh, this is a great way to find uh, proxies for things uh, we either don't have data on or we just simply cannot uh, observe. So this, uh, you, so your research has given us a um, lot of uh, new ideas uh, to search for the right proxies. Uh, as for the number of authors, uh, first, uh, how do you define an author? Uh, so is it, uh, does it have to be someone who wrote a book? Or would you consider the writer of a government document also an author? That's one. Uh, secondly, I, I think for events like uh, the um, uh, Catholic or uh, like the Christian Reformation in the 16th century. I've noticed uh, over the years that, um, you know, at least for Southern Europe, for those uh, diehard uh, loyalists uh, to the uh, Roman Catholic Church, uh, they launched this uh, counter reformation. And which meant probably at least some authors. Uh, in Italy, Spain, and Southern France probably abandoned uh, their authorship work. And the more artists, uh, painters uh, came in as a result. Uh, so that launched sort of a Southern Europe in, in a different direction uh, with uh, artistic uh, expressions. So what, what I'm trying to say is that maybe uh, all uh, creative uh, work or creative professions, uh, not just the book writers, but also uh, artists uh, who just have a different way of expressing their intellectual uh, creativity and so on. So I wonder whether that would actually help improve the, 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 the fit uh, between a uh, uh, number of uh, creative contributors or creative workers and uh, CD size, yeah. Yeah, so these are, these are great questions. And I think they're both kind of related into kind of what's an author. So kind of the second one in terms of artists, and this is also related to your first question. Uh, I have a lot of authors uh, who are just like, for example, there are people who just design, say a retablo, which I guess in a church, right? You carve something, they're gonna be in my sample. Uh, I have people who are, who are doing this stuff. You can think of big artistic centers like Florence, you know, if you, if you sculpt a Madonna. Um, so if you look at the authors, I have like the Getty Museum, which also has a bunch of artifacts as well. So I have some of these people there. Now, I guess, so, so, so you know, maybe I could do more on that. Again, it, it's the issue of, you know, how, how systematic you're going to find these sources. And that gets to the first question of what is an author? Well, an author is going to be someone if they have an authority file in one of these largest uh, you know, um, libraries across the world. So, you know, if the Library of Congress holds an artifact or a book or whatever by one of these authors, they are going to appear in my sample. Um, I take your point that it might be interesting maybe to do something similar I've done with books, print books, to also do it with artistic work. That's a really good idea because I have some of those, I have those in my sample. I don't know what the cover is, because I haven't done a similar exercise, but that's that that's interesting um, to kind of get at this. But I think that ultimately this is, you know, I've talked about authors, but this is creative. Um, you know, this, is, this is broader than just books. It's also kind of creative creativity more 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 broadly. For the Islamic world, for the tabakot, 
um, you know, how you get into one of those things is, is, is a little bit different of a selection process. But, you know, I have scientists, I have people who are writing commentaries on the Quran, um, et cetera. Although in that source, I'm going to have, uh, I don't think I'll have very many art artists. Um, but yeah, I think it's an, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting question. I guess I would fall back onto the, ultimately, to the, to the thing that, you know, I could do better than this, I'm sure, in some ideal world. But as long as the assumptions that I lay out hold, uh, as long as there's a relationship between what I measure and city growth, everything that I said goes through. Uh, if I measured it better, then you know, my shrinkage would be great, greater. I can improve upon existing estimates better, but everything I said will, will continue to hold. Yeah, okay, thank you, Eric. Um, so, uh, so for those of you who have uh, questions or would like to make a comment, uh, please uh, post it in the Q&A box, or if you would like to uh, uh, directly uh, make a comment or ask a question, uh, please uh, uh, raise your hands. Uh, so in the meantime, uh, let me invite Li Duan, uh, a, a doctoral student uh, at the University of Hong Kong who has been working on uh, uh, similar uh, problems uh, and, and, uh, and so on. So, so Li, so you should switch, okay, good, good. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, so I'll share our screen to facilitate my talk. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, that's uh, thanks, uh, Professor Channing, for the uh, very uh, packed presentation we have. We have talked. Uh, it's a lot of work being shown in less than one hour. So with the time I have, uh, I would pre I'll prefer to uh, draw your attention to some key points I, as a reader, find kind of interesting and also significant. Uh, Okay, so first I'll go over the some uh, the main contribution I find uh, significant from this project. Uh, number one is of course is provides better measurement for city growth, uh, city size than previous study inside the written uh, uh, the working working paper. Uh, Professor Chen showed that this uh, works far better than previous study that used the count of notable individuals. So that is definitely the improvement, and. It also adds to the luminosity literature where uh, people use uh, satellite imagery of city lights to proxy for city size. Uh, the main thing I want to emphasize is actually the third point. So I think to my mind, as a PhD student still, I think this set a great example for rigorous data collection in econ history. Because in economic history, most of the data we collect, it has to be uh, its original data collection. So this sets a high standard for all of us. I think the the... Uh, there are two aspects about this data collection exercise being ex exemplary. So the first one is, I find there's so much detail uh, that Professor Chenny went through in order to get this panel data of author with both time, dimension, and location. So this geo-referencing part, when I read this uh, writing sample, I was really shocked. It's just so many, like, so many bulletproof process being gone through. First, there are six sources being involved that uh, Professor Chen used to match his uh, the geographic location of each author. Then he also done this uh, regional specific regression to see if the pattern holds for all uh, for all regions. And he eventually dropped these 110, 11 cities in from southeastern Europe. So that shows the uh, rigor behind all this uh, all these results shown. And also there are inside the paper he also uh, very often do this uh, random accuracy check. We use random sample of 1,000 authors and manually check if their geographic location is correctly matched. So it gives 83% accuracy score. And so I just, this, uh, so this is the first aspect where I just find the process because I'm we are also doing similar project by matching author to its birthday and and the location. So this process really uh, taught me a lesson on how to be rigorous. You have to compare a match between many data sets. And the, the other aspect is how uh, the conceptual framework outlined in this paper really helped to dissuade many concerns we might have, especially the selection bias, uh, because we're using library holding, right? So library holding might have this selection bias or survival rate bias. So there, there are also random sample accuracy or random sample check uh, as shown in the slides earlier that uh, the paper used 1,000 uh, random books, printed books from USTC uh, database. And then uh, compared to the baseline data set inside this paper, and 
it had 81 percent or 93 if you do not count the date author was was date so that is high a very high percentage of a coverage rate and another conceptual framework is how the difference in number of author dying so because this uh the measure is using a difference in difference kind of uh, using the difference in the number of author dying to represent the growth rate. So that, in, in that under that setting, the selection bias can be absorbed by, uh, by time fixed effects. And then I want to point out a few assumptions. There's, I just find most of the assumption that's inside this, uh, behind this, uh, uh, this project just really uh, not very uh, far-fetched. Definitely kind of common sense we all kind of will agree on. So for example, this assumption mentioned in the slides that the ratio of number of authors dying in the city over total population is assumed to be stable over time and also similar in treatment and control group. I think these are probably something we will find uh, natural assumption. So about this second aspect, aspect I would just wanna say, so for, for, for trying to find a proxy for uh, ancient time economic activities, uh, it's not intuitive to use author count. So since it's not very intuitive, then you have to really argue hard by building a conceptual framework, argue how this author count can be a decent proxy for, for the total population for city size. I think that is more challenging than the luminosity literature. We just use satellite imagery of uh, city lights as an economic activity. That was more straightforward. So I think this difficulty, this challenge this paper has is, is more, adds more to its merit. Uh, it, it's kind of creative to think of author could be used as a proxy, but then you have to try very hard to show, uh, in this case, it's a, a Bayesian updating to show that it actually makes sense. So I think those, all those are very, uh, those are the two aspects I find that's the, that's the uh, stands for the rigor of this data collection exercise. And then inside this uh, paper, uh, to, in, inside the slides, Professor Chen also mentioned a bit, but in the paper, it talks more about how this uh, data set can help the Asimoglu uh, Johnson uh, Robinson paper in 2005, where they study Atlantic trade to affecting economic activity, right? So inside that paper, they have to drop four cities. Uh, I remember it's Rotterdam, Liverpool, and uh, Nantes, which because it has missing data. So, but by using this uh, new proxy for economic activities, uh, Professor Chandy was able to add back in this four city. Uh, to make a total of 17 cities. So that's definitely uh, help us to uh, enlarge our data sample in econ history, which is always a struggle. And besides adding more, uh, the number of data observation, uh, since the, the, this uh, author count has high frequency, uh, it's high frequency in nature. So it, it enable us to answer your question previously was unanswerable. Like when did the Atlantic trader starts, uh, trader cities start to diverge from the rest? So previously, the data used in uh, Asimoglu 2005, at, at Tau 2005, was not high frequency enough. But using this uh, data set, we are able to answer, show the trend like the, uh, the figure showed in the slides. We can show the, diver the exact year that the two group of cities starts to diverge. So that is how I feel, and that is another improvement upon the AC, uh, AGAR papers. And about potential application, I can propose from my perspective is, uh, we can definitely do similar stuff using uh, using similar author accounts from China. So inside this uh, paper by Professor Chenning that uh, he specifically excluded East Asia, and we can definitely add in uh, East Asia, especially China uh, China scenario, uh, not just using the VIAF database, but also we can uh, add in database like CBDB from Harvard Fairbank Center. Uh, I believe in that database, we have 400,000 uh, historical figures with their bio information. So we can definitely uh, group these two data together, have a very exhaustive uh, author list. And, but I, I probably the one difficulty I can imagine is it's hard uh, for China database, it's hard to find the exact dying, uh, uh, dying year or birth. That would be the main difficulty. But I find this promising uh, inside uh, China history, uh, econ history study, uh, the measure for population is always sparse. You have one this year, but not no observation over the next 10 years, then another one. So this high frequency data is definitely helpful. Uh, so that is all my role I have prepared. And so I will end the share. Uh, okay, so 
Eric, would you like to say anything, or should I turn on, I turn it over to the audience? Well, well, thank, thank you. Lee, Lee was very, was very complimentary what I, what I, what I did. So I mean, I, I guess thank you. I, I think it's really interesting to kind of consider expanding this to, to China, and you know, I've talked to some, to some Chinese scholars about, about this. It sounds like. You, know, you can do it. You're saying that maybe that the, the the dates aren't as you know you might face some issues with with that, uh, but I think it would be really interesting. I mean, there are, I have a lot of authors from East Asia in my sample, but you know, like I said, given my my linguistic um, limitations, I was reticent to to do this. Given how much I relied on my linguistic skills for Europe and the Islamic world to be a reference people. Um, but but yeah, I, I agree that that it is not clear necessarily a priori why this would be a good proxy. At least now that it's done, it's like okay, it makes sense. But when I was first going about this, um, it was when I was at a seminar at Harvard. Someone someone said, "Hey, is this related to city sizes?" They got me thinking about this. So it's um, yeah, I think I think it's I think you're right about that. Um, but given that it exists, I think it's you know it's it's, it's an interesting new proxy. So thank you, thank you for the comments. I'm glad you found you found the paper compelling. Good. So I, um, I have a few, a few questions from uh, uh, the audience. Uh, first, uh, from uh, Professor William Liu uh, of Nina University in Hong Kong. Uh, so he's asking uh, whether you can actually consider using religion, added religion uh, or religious temples as another proxy because, um, you know, changes in public buildings such as uh, temples and churches uh, of a city, uh, it should be uh, easier to, to collect data for. Um, I guess uh, this might open another venue, uh, another avenue. <laughs> oh, but so this is fascinating. And I think that this is a great point, right? Because the point is, is that, that I, you know, what I showed you before, you know, I, 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 I made it in terms of Stein's paradox, which is where this comes from ultimately, because I think it's maybe easier to understand in a seminar format, but you can kind of interpret this in a Bayesian framework. Like Lee said, I talked about this in the paper. So you can continue to Bayesian update. If you have other proxies that are also correlated with city, with city sizes, you can use that information and incorporate that into the existing estimates. And so I think thinking about it in that Bayesian framework makes a lot of sense when you think about the other potential proxies that are available. You know, you, can, you could presumably, right, do this iteratively. And if you had enough proxies, you could also think of something like crime. If you have crime statistics, which are also correlated with city sizes. You know, there's a, when I was writing this paper, the first draft, there's this large literature in kind of urban studies about how there are certain uh, characteristics whether it's scientific production, creativity, crime, uh, you know, pollution, whatever, that have this systematic, almost linear relationship, uh, at least in logs, with city sizes. And so you can exploit that across a bunch of different proxies to take the, the um, you know, and apply the same methodology that I've, uh, I've applied here to continue to refine existing estimates of city, of city sizes. I'm using this one because this is what I was gathering for other projects and it and it's, makes sense. And I think it increases our understanding. But you could get other, other things as well. I think one of the advantages of authors though is it's very high frequency. Um, you know, uh, you can measure this by year, uh, which is might be more difficult, at least, you know, if you look at church buildings or temples or mosques, you know, those take a long time to build. Um, whether or not an author dies or not is pretty random and you observe that by year. So, but yeah, I think you could do this with a lot of different proxies. And I think in that Bayesian framework, it makes a huge amount of sense. You just keep on updating. Okay, good. So the next question is uh, from uh, Ken Lebo. Uh, a recent paper by Sarah Mitchell, uh, 2019, shows a strong clustering of authors in London since 1700. And compared to other cities in both England and Ireland, this concentration of authors is not uniformly distributed. Um, how does this data set handle this possibility of overinflation of city size based on uh, uh, clustering? Yeah, so that's a great, that's a great point. Uh, I haven't seen this paper, I'll, I'll take a look at it. Um, so ultimately I'm allowing for cities to have a different relationship between scientific 
uh, production and their and their and their sizes. So you know that can be very different across cities. I'm allowing for that to be the case. I'm using within city variation. Now, you know, one thing that you might worry about is say, okay, if there's a structural break within the relationship between authors and city sizes. That as you can imagine, some situation, right, a place like say London, since this is what was raised, you know, all of a sudden it becomes much more knowledge intensive. You could imagine just to say a bunch of universities are founded in London. And then that would break this relationship that I'm assuming is constant. And so while the number of authors, that'll still, that'll still work, it's mapping into, um, into city growth rates will become confused. Now you could change the, the, the conceptual framework to deal with these issues. It's something I haven't done to keep it as simple as possible. But um, yeah, I mean, this is something in the, 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 the results are only gonna be as good as the underlying kind of relationships are. And so in as much as the relationship between author counts and city sizes change over time, then that creates challenges for what I'm doing that have to be, that have to be addressed. But again, across city relationships, as long as they remain stable between author counts and city sizes is something that's not, it's not an issue. Um, so hopefully that answers, that answers the question. If not, I'm happy to answer it. Okay. Um, so next from uh, Mary Debris. Thank you for your talk. I was curious to know, A, what is the relationship between increased patronage, author growth, and population growth? Is there any argument about social mobility that is a subset of population growth, all unrelated? And B, how does this triangulate with qualitative observations in universal histories and uh, tabaqua? Yeah, so, so I think this is very fascinating to think about exactly how patronage and mobility are all related to these, to these things. And getting to the tabakat, right, I mean, historically, a lot of historians in the Islamic world have argued that knowledge was the primary way in which you had social mobility historically in the Islamic world. You could go study, especially after the Sunni revival in a madrasa, and then you could become part of this religious elite, and that was a real path to, to, to mobility. And so, you know, for this, for this, what I'm doing right now, for what I presented today, I remain completely agnostic regarding these things, regarding the underlying mechanisms between city size, economic development, and authors residing in the city. I'm just saying this thing exists, and I'm trying to exploit it to get a new proxy for economic outcomes, which we currently don't have, and which I think can be used by authors, kind of as, as uh, Lee was talking about, the luminosity data. Right, using nightlights. That's been used now in the development literature a huge amount. We've learned a lot from those studies because of this new proxy. That's what I'm trying to do today is do something similar for the historical world. Now, I think though these questions are absolutely fascinating. And presumably, you know, maybe there might be some way using these data to get to get to get at them. I haven't thought about them in, 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 in detail though, but I think they are interesting. Okay, the next one is from uh, Charles Udell. Thank you, for your, uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. This work is fascinating. I'm wondering whether you can test how well your estimates of city population sizes hold for smaller cities where the number of authors dying could be expected uh, to be very, uh, very low. So what is the minimum city size for which you can estimate a relationship uh, between authors and, and uh, independent estimates? Also, how great would you expect the bias to be uh, when comparing cities that you know uh, were comparable, say Newcastle upon uh, Tyne and uh, Oxford in the early modern period when one city is a center of learning? So these are these are again great questions. So in terms of smaller cities, you know, I mean, presumably if this relationship holds, then you should be able to do it for smaller cities. One thing you run into is this normal approximation is, um, you know, if you just do it for small cities, if there aren't a number, a large number of authors living in these cities, then it be, kind of falls apart. So you know, maybe you could do a Poisson, or maybe you just have to work with with binomial, which becomes a lot a lot harder. It's not as clean, at least from a from 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 of a theoretical standpoint, you know, what I've done in this paper is I've limited the analysis to the largest cities, those that are in Bayreuth, Van Zanden, and Chandler. Although 
you know, there are some cities that were really large that these authors didn't include for the Islamic world, which I am going to include in the final version of this draft, uh, of this paper, places like Gorgan or Irbil, et cetera. Uh, so that's what I've done. So how small can you go? It's an empirical question. My sense is, is that it's gonna depend on city. And this gets to the second part of your, of your question. There are some cities that are more knowledge intensive. So if you look at the total number of people dying in Oxford and Cambridge, they're huge numbers. They're comparable with say, you know, London, or I, I, don't, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but they're very large for, for I don't know if they're comparable to London, but they're very large for the underlying uh, sizes of these, these cities. And so that's why I focus on within city variation because there are certainly differences in the underlying structural relationship between city sizes and the number of authors being produced that are gonna vary by city. And so I'm just looking at differences. So how do I compare, say, Newcastle upon Tyne to Oxford? Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at changes in the number of authors working in Newcastle upon Tyne and compare those to changes in the authors working in, 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 in Oxford. And, you know, Using that again, I'm doing it across groups of cities, and what I've done, um, you know, the land like traders of the Mongol invasion. But that's intuitively what I'm doing because I don't have, I don't put any faith in the assumption that somehow the relationship between off and city sizes is constant across cities. So, so that's that, that's what I'm doing. It's a good point. Okay, okay good. So, there's one comment and one question from uh, Charles uh, Udo. A further proxy uh, to consider. Uh, plague incidents might be another example, a disease more generally. That's uh, his comment. Uh, he has two questions. How sensitive are the results to stable mortality rates? Sacking of cities presumably uh, leads to increased mortality. Yeah, no, this is great. So that would, what I'm just going to claim, I ignore these issues because I claim that they are going to be, for the most part, second order, aside from a few given years, maybe around the Black Death. But you could see, you know, if, if, if you know, I went pretty fast because I was trying to cover a lot of material, but there are certain years where you see these dots way above, you know, the, the general kind of mean. And some of that is because these cities are sacked, people die. Uh, some of them are because of plague. Some of them are just due to measurement error. In the, in the, but there are certainly variations in the mortality rate uh, that are very kind of local that are you know, gonna be driven by plagues or kind of sacking. I'm abstracting from those things. And my basic claim, I don't know if this is, people find this convincing or not, is that for the most of, most of the period covered by the data, these cities were not being sacked or they were not subject to super large plagues, which would differentially increase the mortality rate in a given, in a given location. Ultimately, as long as the mortality rate is constant across a, a group of cities, this will all go through. Uh, and while that is certainly violated in kind of very specific times and places, my claim is that, you know, systematically over you know, a long period of time, that's not going to happen. So that's one of the reasons why you see these different and different estimates bounce around, right, that line that I showed earlier, is because of these these, these deviations, which you know, might happen for random reasons at a different time period. But I think that that's, that, that, that worrying about these plagues is, is interesting. And it might also suggest that using, I haven't looked at this, but using these data to say, measure the effects of the plague might not be, might not work because that is, a, that is something that's affecting all cities equally. And so the difference in different stuff isn't gonna, isn't gonna, isn't gonna pick that up. You'd have to look at within city, but that has its own set of issues. So, but those are, these are all good points, and they, I think, highlight both the strengths and the weaknesses of what I'm doing. Uh, great. So uh, we have one minute, oh, we have less than one minute left. Uh, but this is the last uh, question from um, Anwar Al Jahari. Uh, thank you very much for a fascinating framework. Uh, for the Islamic world, you considered the Mongol invasion. How about the effects of the Crusades? Yeah, so this is a great question. It's something I can do. Uh, I briefly, a few days ago, I mean, these data, I'm just, this isn't even completely clean. You are the first people to see this. I briefly looked at Jerusalem because I was curious you know, the Mongol sacking of Jerusalem. And, um, you know, I wasn't able to see anything just off the top of my head, but I haven't completely cleaned those, those data yet. So, you know, um, but you could look at this. I think one of the challenges that I'll face with that is that it was a temporary shock. And so a place like Jerusalem, a lot of how I'm georeferencing some of these people by their nizba. So like a putzi, right? 
from Jerusalem. And a lot of times people would keep that Mizbah uh, even after they left the city. And so that might kind of limit it. But you could do this. And um, I think it's a good idea. Uh, one thing you can definitely see is the Crusades in Spain. I just I kind of showed you that. You can see a drop when, 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 they're, when these areas are conquered by Christians. So you could do it also in the Levant. Um, I think it's a good idea. I don't have any results for you on that. It's a good idea. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Eric, um, for such a wonderful, inspiring present, uh, presentation on your research. Uh, obviously, uh, from the uh, questions and comments, uh, you have opened uh, our thinking uh, in a new direction. This is uh, really great. Uh, and also, I want to thank everyone for uh, attending today's uh, webinar. Uh, I guess, um, you know, now it's also time for me to uh, forecast uh, to uh, pre uh, advertise our next event, which is exactly uh, at the same time uh, next week, next Thursday. Uh, uh, for next Thursday, uh, we have a somewhat uh, different topic, uh, but on more ancient history. Uh, it will be um, uh, on the Roman transport network connectivity and economic integration. Uh, so this is uh, a work by uh, Eric Honan, uh, who is a professor of uh, economic history at the University of Kowloon. So uh, please uh, sign up uh, if uh, you have not, uh, so that we can uh, send you more information on upcoming uh, quantitative history webinar events. Uh, I guess um, this is it for today. Thank you very much uh, for joining us, uh, especially uh, my uh, thanks go to um, uh, Eric and then uh, Lee. Okay, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.